Let me try that again. They actually resembled animals more than human beings. And I think we look at children that way as well. They have the potential to be mature human beings who can contribute to society, but only potentially. We don't know how they will end up eventually. And so when somebody says to an adult, you are acting like a child, it very often has negative connotations. Because essentially what they're saying is, you are acting irrationally. You are acting more like an animal than a human being. And that's exactly what Jesus says to his contemporaries. You are acting like children. So this afternoon, we're going to unpack what Jesus meant when He said that. I mean, that is the point of studying this parable of the children in the marketplace. But before we do that, I want to have a word of methodology. What am I thinking as I go into trying to interpret this parable? And I want to quote the author who's been quoted many times this week, and that is Snodgrass. And in his work on the parables, this is what he says on page 7 about methodology. He says, hardly anything said about parables, whether defining them or explaining their characteristics, is true of all of them. And I think what this means is we ought to take the parables on a case-by-case basis. And we should therefore refrain from absolute statements about the parables. I've heard over the years people try to make absolute statements about the parables. And it works. Some of what they say works a good majority of the time, but not all the time. So I've heard this before. Parables are lessons that have one meaning. One spiritual meaning. Simple lessons, and they convey only one meaning. Well, does that work sometimes? Yeah, that works sometimes. Does it work with all of them? No, it doesn't. I've also heard people say we should never interpret the parables allegorically. And yet the one parable, one of the only parables that we have the interpretation for, the parable of the sower, is allegorical. And what do I mean by allegory, just to be clear about this? When one thing is said, but another thing is meant... So, sometimes when we're reading the parables, it's worth asking, what is the referent in the parable? That's legitimate for our parable, the children in the marketplace. So again, let's not be absolute in our statements of how to interpret the parables or how not to interpret the parables. So in other words, I'm not going to be going around looking at other parables for help with this little parable. It's got its own difficulties. So let's look now at the parable. And I'm going to use Matthew's version. This is in Matthew 11, verse 16 and following. There's another version toward the end of Luke chapter 7. And I'm not going to compare the versions. Sometimes that's helpful. In other words, when we see something in the synoptic tradition, or the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it's helpful to compare them. But we should also remember that the original recipients of the Gospel of Matthew, I think, almost definitely didn't have a copy of Mark or have a copy of Luke. They only had the one Gospel. So if we put ourselves in their position, we really are trying to figure out what does this say in the Gospel of Matthew. And by the way, Luke 7 and and Matthew 11 are very close in this respect with with regard to this parable. But I'm not going to go back and forth. I think in this case it may be a little bit uh, confusing, even though they are very similar. All right, so Matthew 11, verse 16. In the context here, just as in Luke 7, John the Baptist is in prison. And he sends his messengers to Jesus asking what I think is a pretty legitimate question from John's perspective. Are you the coming one, or should we expect another? Why do I say that's legitimate? Well, because the forerunner of the Messiah is now in prison. I don't think he saw that coming. And so it's a legitimate question. 
And what does Jesus say? Does Jesus condemn him for his lack of faith? No, he doesn't. In fact, quite the opposite. He uses it as an opportunity to talk about how great John the Baptist is. And he basically says, of all those born of women, which of course includes everybody, John the Baptist is the greatest. But even the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than him. It's a tremendous statement about John on the one hand, but also about those who are members of the kingdom of heaven on the other. So it is in that context that Jesus tells this parable. Matthew 11, verse 16, But what, till, what shall I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplaces and shouting to one another, We played the flute for you and you did not dance. We wailed and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say he has a demon. For the Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Look, a glutton and a drunkard and a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. So our first issue here is, what is the referent of this generation? Or rather, I should say, what, are the, what is the referent of the children in the marketplace? Does just one group refer to that generation and the other group refer to John and Jesus? That's typically how it's been interpreted. So, in other words, you've got two groups of children in the parable, right? You've got the children who are calling out, and then you have the children who refuse to play. Are Jesus and John the group that refuse to play, or are they the group that calls out and the generation refuses to play? Now, I have to say the second option, and that is John and Jesus are the ones who are, I'm doing air quotes if you're looking down, they're the ones playing funeral or playing wedding, and the generation doesn't follow. They're not playing along. Conceptually, that makes a lot of sense. But in terms of the text itself, there are some problems. First of all, notice again how Jesus frames the introduction. To what shall I compare this generation? Now, if John and Jesus are part of this crowd of children in the marketplace, then he is considering himself and John part of this generation. Does Jesus ever do that? I don't know of another place anywhere where Jesus does that. That would be highly unique, and therefore, I think it's highly unlikely. All right, well, what about the other interpretation? It's the same problem. So what then is it? I think the generation refers to both groups. The point's still the same, and that is Jesus' generation refused to listen to God's messengers, whether they're talking about the extremes of judgment or whether they're talking about the extremes of joy and love and mercy. It doesn't matter what they're saying, that generation isn't going to listen. That's the point of the parable. And I think the children in the marketplace represent that generation, period. John and Jesus, therefore, aren't the reference of the children. It's their reaction or their lack of reaction that Jesus is condemning there. All right, so we've got another problem here, and that is in verse 19. In verse 19, notice again what it says. John came neither eating and drinking, verse 18, he, and they, everybody says he has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking. They say, look, a glutton and a drunkard. A glutton and a drunkard. Some commentaries will point back to this passage in Deuteronomy 21, verse 18 and following. In Deuteronomy 21, verse 18, we have a problematic passage. And that is the passage wherein it says, verse 18, if someone has a stubborn and rebellious son who does not obey his father and mother and will not listen to them when they discipline him, his father and mother shall take hold of him and bring him to the elders of the gate of his town. They shall say to the elders, this son of ours is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey us. He is a glutton and a drunkard. And then it says, they will stone him to death and Israel will purge the evil from their midst. This passage is so problematic that later on in the Babylonian Talmud, 
in the Tractate Sanhedrin, there's an entire chapter devoted to this passage. And do you know what they end up saying? There never was a stubborn and rebellious son. It's legal fiction. It's in the text to help us study, is basically what they say. It's so problematic. Now, again, how does this refer to Jesus? Well, some commentaries, as I said, when Jesus says that he is referred to as a glutton and a drunkard, some look to this passage in Deuteronomy 21 and verse 20, and they say, Jesus' contemporaries are basically saying he's the rebellious son, and therefore he ought to be stoned. Now, if that's true, that is a remarkable statement. Unfortunately, if you look at the Septuagint version of Deuteronomy 21, verse 20, and then you look at Matthew or Luke, in this case, the vocabulary is the same, they're just not close at all. So we can't get that from the Septuagint, which is where we might expect to get it from. And some scholars have said, well, how about the Aramaic Targum or the Targumim? Well, okay, Targum Onkelos, which is the earliest and the most literal translation. As you remember, the, the Targumim are the Aramaic translations of the Hebrew. It says this in verse 20, The son of ours is defined or rebellious. He does not obey our command. He is a glutton with meat and a drunkard with wine. This is closer to what Jesus says. But there are a couple problems with that. This Targum isn't dated until the 2nd century A.D. Okay, maybe the tradition goes back to the time of Jesus, but we can't prove that. We can't show that. So it's only a possibility. Remember, when we're looking at issues like this, the question is not what's possible, because there are a lot of things that are possible. It's what is most probable, and I don't think this is most probable. It's an interesting possibility, but nothing more. So in other words, I do not think that when they say Jesus is a glutton and a drunkard, they are referring back to Deuteronomy 21.20. Again, that's an extraordinary claim. And for extraordinary claims, we need extraordinary evidence. We don't have that here. All right. So how does the parable end? Sometimes when we look at parables, a good way to figure out exactly what is being stated is to look at the end. In some gospel studies, this is referred to as the pronouncement, a pronouncement story, but also some parables have pronouncements at the end. What is the pronouncement here at the end of this parable? Yet wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. Does that help us very much? No, that's somewhat enigmatic. But I think we can get at what Jesus is saying here. I think Jesus here is appealing to a notion that we find in the Old Testament, it just seems we don't talk about it very much. And that is the presence and importance of wisdom in creation, but also in Israel's history in various ways. And that's borne out even more in non-canonical Jewish writings. What am I talking about? Well, think about what Proverbs 8 and verse 22 and following says about creation, but more specifically, what it says about wisdom's role in creation. When we think about the creation account, normally, of course, we think about Genesis 1, we think about Genesis 2, but Proverbs 8 ought to be considered as well. Proverbs 8, 22 says, Yahweh brought me, the me there is wisdom, forth as the first of his works before his deeds of old. And then after that, it talks about various aspects of creation, and wisdom is involved in all of them. How about Psalm 104.24, which sort of restates what Proverbs 8 says. How many are your works, Yahweh? In wisdom you made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. In wisdom you made them all. Wisdom, again, has a hugely important part in creation. But again, what about those non-canonical works? Well, there's one work called Wisdom that's in the Apocrypha, and so again, when we talk about these non-canonical Jewish works, why are they important? Why are they sometimes worth reading? Sometimes they're not worth reading, but sometimes they are. Why is that? Because they can shed light on ideas in the New Testament like what we're talking about here. And so if we have a better understanding of what those ideas are, naturally we can understand the text better. Because Jesus isn't operating in a vacuum. 
Jesus isn't going to uh, ask or talk about ideas that people have nothing, uh, they have no knowledge about it. I mean, I, I use this example quite a bit in class. Some of you have been in my classes, and so you probably t- you're probably tired of this example. Well, sorry, not sorry. Um, no. Um, why doesn't Jesus have a parable about the lost iPhone? Why doesn't he do that? Because they wouldn't have understand that, understood that at all. It would have made no sense to them. So Jesus teaches, and the other apostles teach within the paradigms of the Jewish tradition. And so just because this may not be spelled out in explicit terms in the New Testament, that doesn't mean it's not in the background. I think it's in the background of a lot of passages. So, again, this passage in Wisdom Chapter 7, 22 uh, through 25, and this is just one of many passages. It says, There is in wisdom a spirit that is intelligent, holy, unique, manifold, subtle, mobile, clear, unpolluted, all-powerful, overseeing all, penetrating through all spirits that are intelligent and altogether subtle. For wisdom is more mobile than any motion because of her pureness. She pervades and penetrates all things. She is a breath of the power of God and a pure emanation of the glory of the Almighty. Therefore, nothing defiled gains entrance into her. That phrase of pure emanation of the glory of the Almighty, some of this ought to sound familiar. It sounds like the hymn in Colossians chapter 1. Well, how about Philo of Alexandria? We don't talk as much about Philo. Uh, there's good reason for this. First of all, he's really difficult to understand in some cases. But Philo was a very educated Jew living in Alexandria, a rough contemporary of Paul, and, and therefore Jesus. There's no evidence that they ever uh, he met either one of those individuals. But, but this is what he says. The divine word who is high above all these has not been visibly portrayed, being likened to none of the sense-perceptible objects. No, He is Himself the image of God, the highest of all beings, intellectually perceived, placed nearest with no intervening distance to the long, truly existent One. And then He says, uh, The Word is the charioteer of the powers. He who talks is seated in the chariot, giving direction to the charioteer for the right wielding of the reins of the universe. We don't have... 40 more minutes to unpack that passage because there's a lot in there that's quite difficult, honestly. But he, in other passages, he connects these same ideas to wisdom. So again, wisdom is described in this Jewish text just as Jesus is described elsewhere in the New Testament. So Matthew doesn't go out of his way to identify Jesus and wisdom. I think he assumes it. And so back to the parable. When he says wisdom is justified by her deeds, he's basically saying Jesus is justified by his works. The Messiah is justified by his deeds. Davies and Allison, in their extremely thorough, and it's somewhat dated now, but it's still very good commentary on Matthew, they say this, Quote, despite the poor response of the people, the works of Jesus have been made plain to all for Jesus' identity and the need to respond to him favorably. If people still disbelieve, that is not wisdom's fault. That is not Jesus' doing. The blame lies with those who have ears but do not hear. Were wisdom to be brought to trial with the crime of not stirring Israel to faith, she would be acquitted. Her works, that is, Jesus' works, exonerate her by hearing testimony to her labor for others, end quote. In other words, just because this generation of Jesus' contemporaries doesn't listen and do not obey God, regardless of whether the message is judgment or the message is mercy, the fault is not with wisdom. The fault is not with Jesus. And of course, ultimately, the fault's not with God, it's with the people. They had the opportunity. So I think that's the meaning of the parable. So what are some practical takeaways? Because as we've said so many times this week, I shouldn't say we, I haven't said it until now, but as others have said so far this week, and as Edwin started us off so strongly Monday night by saying, if the parables don't challenge us, we're not doing something right. 
So if we look at this parable and we say, that's about Jesus' contemporaries. That's not about me. That's about people who refuse to hear the message of God. I haven't refused that. I'm a disciple of Christ's. I've accepted it. I believe it. It's not a problem for me, so he's not talking about me. If that's our response to this parable, we're missing it. And I would go further to say, if that's our response to a lot of Scripture, we're not doing something right. Let's think about these two extremes of God's message. Judgment and mercy. What about judgment? We sometimes are very proud to say we accept and we teach God's judgment. There are a lot of other groups that really don't want to get close to that idea, honestly. But we're not ashamed of it. We proudly proclaim God's judgment as well we should. But what about God's judgment on us? Because when we think about judgment, what do we typically think about? What's in your mind right now as you think about God's judgment upon human beings? What groups are you thinking about? Are you thinking about homosexuals? Are you thinking about adulterers? Are you thinking about murderers? Are you thinking about those people who really perform the big sins? Or are you thinking about yourself? There's a passage, Tommy talked about passages that scare him, and that, I thought that was so well put, that passages scare us when we understand what they're saying. That's how I feel about Matthew 12, 36, where Jesus says that every careless word that we speak, we're, gonna have a get, we're going to give an account. We're going to need to give an account to God for those careless words. If I were to ask you to raise your hands if you've ever said a careless word, I don't think anybody in here would not have their hand up. I know I wouldn't. Every careless word. And this becomes magnified even more when we realize how differently we use language now than, than they did then. You may be thinking, what are you talking about? Well, to put it bluntly, our opportunities to mess up when we communicate have been magnified, have been multiplied through text and social media. Don't get me started on social media. I can proudly say I don't have a social media account. Now, why do I say that? Is it so I can do some moral grandstanding? Yeah, a little bit. No. <laughs> no, it's not that. It's because I feel like it negatively impacted me when I did have it, and I didn't like that. So I stopped it all together. Maybe some of you can see the positives. It's hard for me to. But every careless word. So when we talk about God's message of judgment, we've got to deal with passages like that and many others that are difficult, that are challenging. Well, okay, uh, uh, let's talk about God's message of love. Much easier topic to deal with, right? I mean, who doesn't want to talk about that as a believer? Who doesn't want to talk about God's mercy and love? Does that ever get uncomfortable? Well, it should. Because if God loved us, which of course He did, then that means our obligation is to love other people. That's where things get more challenging again. So again, when you think about loving other people, who are you thinking about? What group are you thinking about? Well, when I think about it, I think about my family. It's pretty easy to love, right? Because they, they love me, at least most of the time. So it's pretty easy right? But what if we are thinking about loving people who don't like us, people who disagree with us, people who think differently than us about political matters or about social issues or about religious issues? How about loving those people? Because we live in a society, as this last year has clearly shown, that doesn't know how to do that. And I hate to even say this, but we could probably think of some Christians in the last year who was maybe on social media again. I promise I'm not going to go off on social media anymore. But even on social media, they haven't shown love toward those with whom they disagree. 
That's not right. That's not accepting the message of God which contains both judgment and mercy. I find this parable challenging in a lot of different ways. And I hope I've I've probably clumsily gone through some of the problems of interpretation. But the problem with the parables... And the problem with the Bible generally for me, mostly, is not interpretation. It's application. So let us continue to be challenged by the parables, but also by God's Word in general. Thank you.